a warm uh, virtual welcome to all of our uh, all of our uh, speakers and uh, question panelists and i'm going to hand over to mick and paul paul seems to have the ball so uh, i'll back out over to you gentlemen so uh, thank you steve um from a rather rainy uh north of england uh, in the uk um so i'm just going to take a, a few minutes to sort of set up First question I'm going to pose, just take it in, in, for a couple of minutes, is you know the challenge of is architecture still necessary? It, it, I guess most people on this uh, particular uh, uh, conference will argue quite strongly against that, and and I will as well. But uh, basically, it is a constant challenge that uh, that we see. Uh, do you still need architecture in the age of design thinking and agile? So. The way that kind of position that is, I like to think that essentially um, enterprise architecture has been through a number of different uh, winters. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. And agile in particular is just the latest and perhaps a particularly deep winter. Um, and the architecture itself uh, over the years has had these kind of challenges and has emerged from them. So what does that mean for the for the latest? Uh, and, and why do what do I mean by winter? Well, um, this is a, a hand-drawn uh, image that I've presented a few times, and I, and I, I want to sort of drew it the first time. A few people um, stopped me going away and getting it done professionally because they kind of liked the fact that it was hand-drawn because it kind of illustrated the, the the thinking and the flow. So I've kept it like that. So hopefully uh, it still makes sense. Uh, but you can see it is literally just a, a, a one-off drawing. But I'm old enough and have been around in IT long enough that if you start on the top left hand side, um, people created bespoke solutions. Um, where I first started work was in an aerospace company and uh, I worked on a, a spares uh, provisioning system and it was completely different to the inventory system. And again, was completely separate and different to the finance system. They weren't joined up at that point whatsoever. Um, and of course, what that did is created a bunch of siloed systems. And from that, um, uh, not from my, my particular uh, organization, but from that, uh, that pattern happening around the world, um, uh, enterprise architecture was born, uh, you know, trying to join it all back up and uh, support that great thing that uh, underpins uh, the whole of the open group interoperability. So, you know, that happened for a short while, but then sort of big ERP packages came along and other packages. And, and for a while again, people were saying, well, why do you need to worry about architecture when your, your process models and your data models are given to you wall to wall? Well, we soon found out uh, through that winter that actually all the different packages, whether they were ERP packages, whether they were PLM packages, CRM packages, lots and lots of acronyms, they didn't actually necessarily join up as neatly as we wanted them to. There were a few gaps and overlaps, and we still needed to bring these things together so they could interoperate. Um, and so EA came out of that winter realizing it had a role to play. Um, not long after that, we got into service buses and integrated solutions. And again, you can see another uh, set, sort of a criticism uh, that sort of challenge towards do we need to have architecture when all we've got to do is plug and play well guess what again we had went through that winter and we came out and ea was still needed for that interoperability so, so why do i kind of keep going through these well these series of winters i think the latest ones where we've had multiple cloud provision lots of solutions being built up in agile way proof of concepts have basically shown that actually we've gone through this winter but what we're tending to find and what I've seen a lot of is a lot of small projects which are highly successful, really fast, very, very popular in the business, don't necessarily scale. They don't have all the security in them they need and, and the assurance, and they certainly don't all uh, necessarily talk to one another. And that's just if you look within an organization. Nowadays, and certainly this is uh, very true, the need to work across ecosystems and interoperate with many others and collaborate uh, actually forces the need to be able to uh, underpin that interoperability. And hence, we move to something that I would refer to as a, an agile version of EA. That's EA for both agile businesses, agile software development, 
as well as making enterprise architecture more agile itself. So, so that, that's what I meant by an architecture winter. And where I'm just going to kind of summarize out to then is, is what, what that means for us is, um, you know, large organizations, especially that have got brand big reputations and brands to match uh, or, or a complex, have got lots of legacy. Uh, there's a lot of things that they need to worry about still. And we're seeing that um, being able to worry about that, being able to worry about how you manage your portfolio of lots of proof of concepts so that it, it interweaves into that environment uh, is, a, is still a big challenge for those organizations. Um, in addition, people and the, the actual, me the way we kind of look at uh, uh, the demand for architects uh, still seems to be going up, right? Every measure we have shows more and more people. Uh, you know, the, the, the figures change. Uh, uh, Andrew took you through some of those. Um, uh, but other things uh, like SAFE and, and uh, you know, various uh, technology credentials uh, are growing and growing all the time. So what does that really mean? Well, we need to ensure that our basic architectural principles and understanding are still there, but that they are held within the context of, of an agile world. So what have we been doing? Oh, have I moved forward one too many? Uh, what we've been doing is actually um, uh, will we'll be covered in, in the backlog and the portfolio areas that we're going through. Uh, and I think uh, my other colleague is going to pick up on that. OK, so like, uh, like Paul was explaining, architecture the price of data has been over a series of stage or because winter, which is a very interesting concept. Now we're going to explain how we are facing this into the open group architecture portfolio, which is even though the TOCA standard is the main product, we have other products as well that also very well suit to complement this and to learn us understand better how EA should fit those new challenges. In talking about challenges, I think there's different ways in which we can face a crisis. Uh, some people, whenever something is dangerous, will take some shelter to the protected, while some others, even though being cautious, they will see also things as an opportunity to grow and become rich. And I guess that's something that we all, all we should apply in the different disciplines, being, of course, architecture, one of those disciplines. So what we are doing in the Open Group Architecture Portfolio is having this balance of transform, evolve, and optimize business. So we are always focusing EA to driving value to organizations, having this shift in mind to have a more outside in view, being more flexible to new changes, being more agile and digital, to optimize the resources that we have at the enterprise and to have this constant evolution. It was some question in the previous session about how we are considering all this into the total standards. So what we're doing right now, as we're going to explain now, and also Chris is going to explain the, the section corresponding to agile, we have a set of different working projects into the architecture forum, which is a portfolio of activities. Each one of them is taking a different area of knowledge some trends that need to be addressed in the standard, we call that the TOGA backlog. And this TOGA backlog includes things like digital, agile, being able to adopt the new trends, how architecture can support the decision making of new technologies, trends adoption, microservice architecture, cloud, uh, all these activities all, all, all together into this architecture portfolio, the view that we have into this. And we also have been uh, searching over the concept of having a sustainable EA. Sustainable is something that can make good use of the resources and can allow the resources to be reused again in a world that optimize them, keeping the organization growing. So applying this to EA, EA has always been about maximizing synergies, having this holistic view of the organization. But now we are combining that into having a lean agile approach delivering a value faster, keeping at the same time the high level of strategic vision, the governance and the risk assessment that we need to have in architecture, having more an outside in thinking, being more customer and product focus, even though we still can handle the concept of a project, an architecture project, at the end of the day, what we need to do is to deliver value in the form of products and services. So we are doing also that assessment on how to provide guidance on that particular aspect. And also to be able to provide a rapid response and be flexible to changes. And in that, there's also a shift 
and what the role of the architecture should be. Actually, you can go over the open group blogs and you'll see some interesting blogs in there about the role of the new architect. It's a very interesting blog, so I invite you to take a look on that. It's basically to become a consultant, an internal consultation, to precisely allow this a sustainable EA concept. Actually, Mick will present after this uh, some, some concepts about stakeholder considerations for the EA profession. And what about the, the portfolio itself? Like I said, besides the TOGAF standard, which is a de facto standard for enterprise architecture, we also have other ones. We handle also the Archimate standard, which is a modeling notation. Some of you deliver a lot of questions about Archimate in the last session. Archimate is aimed to be used alone with the TOGAF standard to provide the architecture description support for that. There are a lot of very good tools available in the market. You can look at the list of certified tools in our site. And also, like Andrew explained, there is also certification available for that. In terms of the work into the forum, we are working in a harmonization project between the TOGAF standard and the Archimate modeling notation. And it's going to be a very interesting guide that is aimed to provide guidance on how the two standards can be used together. There are also other guidance that is work in progress. One of them is how the TOGAF standard can be used to support the digital enterprise. Uh, but some of you that were in the Digital Management Day on the Monday may have heard a presentation about this. We are delivering guidance on how the, the TOGAF standard can support the different contexts that we have in the DP book and how architecture can leverage the digital profession. And we also have the Agile Architecture Framework. Uh, also, some people have been uh, asking questions about that. It's another open group standard that is right now a work in progress. And uh, it's going to also be guidance about how the TOGAF standard and the Agile Architecture Framework are aimed to be used together. The Agile Architecture Framework has a more specific view. It's going into Agile Architecture and is providing a lot of very interesting guidance in that aspect. How do you know TOGAF is, has a wider scope in that? It's not only addressing Agile, has a, uh, Agile EA has a new architectural style, but has also been in all of those winters that Paul explained. So it's covering much more than that. So it can be used uh, in a more using this word traditional way, supporting, for example, a big organization that needs more governance and risk assessment, and also another organization that is moving more into the agile digital, or another one that is using both approaches. So that standard can be used to support all that. And also another work in progress, we also need to have a more coherent view of the different set of public group standards. So there are a lot of work in progress in the architecture portfolio about harmonization, like I just mentioned with the DP book. We also have harmonization with Archimate. We have another harmonization work with the IT for IT standard. And we're working with the SOA working group around microservice architecture and cloud. And we also have another very interesting project with the security forum about zero trust architecture, like building of reference models for that. And also we have a lot uh, delivering a set of very interesting guide in different aspects, like this architecture, some of you are familiar with those, and also information architecture. So like you will see, we are working into the architecture forum to evolve this portfolio uh, to keep the core foundation of the practice, but at the same time to evolve and transform to cover also uh, new trends and the new technologies that are right now available. Now we're going to talk, uh, we're going to, to have Mick uh, talking about the stakeholders and their impact on the EA. So Simon, if you could please make Mick present so he can go over the presentation. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah, well, uh, I'm very pleased to be with you all. Uh, Today, um, I'm dialing in from uh, the, the, the UK. Um, I've got a bit of sunshine outside, and I hope your weather is pleasant and all, all, you're all safe, uh, first and for, foremost. Uh, what I'd like to do um, just over the next kind of five or ten minutes is to uh, focus on you know, the architecture demand uh, drivers that are at play and the different types of architecture work. Uh, that are eventuating from that um, demand. Um, obviously, you know, there's the a set of probably like generic uh, drivers that have been in play now for you know the last 12 months or so that I'll come to shortly on, on, on the slide. I want to talk to, but before I do that, um, I do want to get into you know, the major driver for um, um, organisations, be it public sector or private sector, uh, today. 
and that is the um, uh, the response to um, COVID-19, which is certainly um, generating um, a lot of activity in in the marketplace um, that is now rippling down into uh, the sphere of um, architecture. So what I'd like to do is just take you through the top three kind of areas of work that uh, COVID-19 is um, focusing organizations' m m minds on um, in terms of you know, areas where architecture can help out. Um, uh, the first area is people and you know, the impact of you know, COVID-19 on basically vir vir virtual working and what that means for uh, the, the workforce. The public sector and private sector organizations are you know, having to deal with a, a new way of working, uh, and that's going to have some you know, massive downstream connotations uh, go, going forward. Um, architecturally, those organizations that have you know, written down operating models in terms of their organization and the capabilities that they are using are in far better shape to respond to what they want to configure their organizations uh, to for the new working um, environment. Uh, and there's two real kind of areas that our, um, our architects are, are looking at currently in this people uh, space. The first one is uh, profiling and skills. Have we got the right level of, of expertise, be it in-house or, or external, to do the work that we need um, for, for, for the future. So there, there, there's an opportunity there of kind of like retraining, reskilling, uh, channel shifting um, work uh, that is being looked at. And that, that's closely coupled with, you know, the different ways of working and how that, that will impact, you know, infrastructure for organizations and, and you know, in terms of like real estate, for example, and also in terms of technology. That's the first one for COVID-19. So the second one is um, finance, um, where you know, architects are looking at basically value chains uh, within organizations to ensure that cash flow is well understood and any mitigations can, can be put, put in place. So we've got people, finance. And thirdly, uh, one I'd like to draw your attention to is uh, the supply chain uh, in, in which organizations invariably um, sit. And architects are now being um, employed to look at principally uh, counterparty risks uh, with, with regards to you know, supply of, of goods or services to actually fulfill their own uh, value proposition to the market. So we've got a real focus now uh, for, for architects from an EA and solution perspective to uh, address those, those three uh, category areas that are being like driven out by you know the advent of uh, COVID-19, uh, people, finance, and the uh, supply chain. Now we'll get into the more um, what I call generic drivers that are at play. And if, if Sonia could uh, kindly just flip to the next next slide. Um, yeah, these are the main groups that are um, interested um, from a you know, demand creation perspective with, with architecture. The, the first broad group is, is at the executive um, board level, um, and, and they are and still remain to be, you know, the, the, the paymasters for a lot of our architecture work within organizations. Um, and they're principally um, interested in, you know, how to transition organizational states to effect strategy. So what are our, are our options from an organizational perspective um, in terms of change that can give us a be better outcome? And, you know, the EA response to that working with, you know, business and IT is to produce a cohesive operating model. Um, that's uh, designed by, by, by principle that, that come from the, the board um, to effect the, the, those changes. 
Uh, the, the secondary is um, we're seeing a lot of is uh, in, in the risk uh, and certainly the cyber uh, space where you know cyber threats are you know increasingly being taken in, into account because uh, they're actually in, in impacting the, um, the underpinning kind of insurance uh, models for organizations. People have conned on to the, the, the fact that you know a lot of uh, damage can be done by, by cyber uh, threats. Um, insurance companies are you know really trying to come up to speed with you know the varying uh, risk threats that are at play and trying to update their, their, their products as quickly as possible uh, to cater for that. Uh, so what that means for organizations is that they have got to have a, a fairly robust view with regard to you know, the information that's at, at play and uh, the threat level um, associated with basically compromise of, of that asset. So um, architects are you know, basically being employed to create information-centric architectures uh, to cascade you know, associated risk profiles from. Uh, the third area is um, in, in, in the area really of um, technology innovation. Um, and we're seeing you know, a lot of a a activity where you know, companies have a, a steady state IT model and they're using basically architecture uh, patterns to evaluate um, new products and technologies that are coming over the horizon for them uh, to create business advantage. So that uh, stakeholder group there, CTO, maybe CIO type organization, is being uh, increasingly forced to look at um, innovation. That may also come out of the uh, the business organization in form of a uh, you know, chief digital officer uh, type, type setup. Regardless, the bottom line is the use of um, technology reference models uh, married up to you know, a clear IT strategy is what a lot of organizations are, are doing to actually create um, architectural um, advantage. Uh, the, the, the fourth stakeholder group, um, where I, I'm currently heavily involved in a very large um, government de department, uh, which is undergoing a, a transformation, is to use basically architecture reference models to produce baseline costings so that you know, a procurement based conversations can be had w with, with the market. And in order to do that, you know, the, the current, common uh, uh, currency of, of the architect, which is, you know, actors, uh, service descriptions and, and service, et cetera, are all bought into play to actually create a model that eventuates in a, in a baseline cost model that can be used in a, a commercial negotiation. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, we're seeing a lot of activity in the cloud space where, you know, there's basically hybrid models of cloud um, in play with, within organizations and applications are being provisioned in, in SaaS type, SaaS type uh, environments, uh, you know, the driver to get a handle on, you know, the best bang for a book, as it were, with regard to service provision is re really paramount. And we're seeing combinations of TOGAF and uh, modern language like Archimate be, being used for that. So I, I hope that, that gives, gives you a feel for um, you know, what, what's going on out there um, in, in, in industry in, in a broader sense with regards to EA uh, demand drivers and uh, re responses. Uh, and now I'd like to just hand back to uh, Sonia whoever the driver is of this uh, system uh, to continue with the presentation. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, how, no, our next presentation now is for Chris Frost. He's going to talk about Agile and how we are talking and working into the Architecture Forum around Agile and TOGAF and EA. So, Chris, up to you. Okay, thank you very much, Sonia. Um, I'll just move us straight on to opening slide here. So, hello, everybody. 
My name's Chris Frost and uh, I'm from Fujitsu. I'm going to be talking about one of the pieces of work that was uh, mentioned a little earlier on that's going on inside the Architecture Forum and that's to produce some guidance about how TOGAF works in an agile delivery environment. So I'd like to start by thinking really why one of the reasons why we're doing this and one of the reasons is some myths that are commonly heard in the marketplace, myths like TOGAF standard is waterfall, TOGAF is big design up front. And if you accept those things, then that would basically mean TOGAF standard isn't agile. But I would say very strongly, I believe that is that is not the case. But, uh, to go through these uh, few slides here, explain more about why that is absolutely not the case. But why should these myths emerge? Why should it be that TOGAF is perceived perhaps as a as a waterfall method? Perhaps it's just simply because the crop circle diagram that we're all very familiar with shows the phases separately with the little interconnecting arrows between them. Uh, and perhaps it's because in the standard descriptions of it, uh, in all the reference cards and other materials that we get shows the phases laid out in sort of lists and tables and perhaps all of that together gives that impression that it's a very serial thing, you know, phase A, then phase B and phase C and so on. And also maybe it's because historically it's true that uh, enterprise architecture projects used to be delivered in that way. I reflect myself on some of the things that I was involved in was back in the 1990s, even early 2000s. Then it's true that that indeed was a common approach to uh, this sort of project. But we mustn't forget, and uh, actually Paul touched on this point earlier on, architecture is vital, remains vital for any large scale project. And the need for that architecture doesn't somehow disappear just because the project is being delivered in two week sprints. And if you want some supporting evidence of that, just look at some of the industry leading frameworks for doing agile at scale. At scale. And uh, some of these frameworks, some of these uh, frameworks for agile at scale explicitly recognize the need for architecture and for architects. And I think a great little illustration of um, why that is, is the Leaning Tower of Pisa here on the slides. Um, architecture is necessary to give guidance when you've got large groups of people all working together that need to produce some sort of single coherent integrated output and also it's necessary to identify those things that really need to be thought through and designed out a little bit up front and a great example is buildings where it's necessary to put down those foundations first and make sure those foundations are fit for the building that's going to be put on top of it. And that's sadly what our friends in Pisa got slightly wrong. The foundations were, were not deep enough or not strong enough and uh, the tower leaned. Now it's interesting to reflect, of course, uh, about this particular example that had the tower been built straight and true as it was originally intended, um, then it probably wouldn't have been anything like so famous and, pe and anybody outside of northern Italy probably wouldn't have known anything about the Tower of Pisa and we probably wouldn't see millions of tourists flocking to see the straight and true Tower of Pisa. But, but I would say those guys got lucky. They got lucky that the tower didn't fall. Um, and if anybody thinks it's a good idea to go into large scale projects without an architecture, then to paraphrase Clint Eastwood, you've got to ask yourself, do you feel lucky? And I don't think trusting to luck is a very good and professional way uh, to go about large scale projects. Now, if we look at what's already available to TOGAF practitioners, if you look in the TOGAF library, you'll already find quite a number of things that give uh, some guidance about TOGAF and Agile. As far back as 2012, there was a white paper, uh, World Class EA, the Agile Enterprise, uh, 
happens to be document code W123. If you want to look it up in the TOGAF, in the uh, Open Group Library. Um, and then more recently in 2018, there's a TOGAF series guide about uh, practitioner's approach to the TOGAF ADM. And you can see the details there on the slide. And in section 12 of that, it talks a little bit about TOGAF and Agile. And more recently, just last year, 2019, there's another white paper about using Agile practices in the ad in uh, enterprise architecture. And then, of course, in the main TOGAF core standard document, version 9.2, chapter 18 talks about applying iterations to the ADM, which isn't enough to be agile by itself, but it's quite a major part of uh, an agile delivery style. So there is already some guidance available out there, but we decided more was needed in the open group. And in early 2012, this working group was started that I'm currently leading. Um, with a very simple statement uh, of purpose to produce a TOGAF series guide on how TOGAF standard can be adapted to agile working. And like most uh, open group working groups, it's uh, filled with volunteer members, people like myself from member companies uh, volunteering some of their time and effort to contribute this work, currently 37 of us last time I did a count up. And uh, we are currently working on building some additional guidance for TOGAF and Agile. And I'd like to give a few small examples from the draft guide that we're building at the moment. And a really important thing that it starts off with uh, is this simple statement about the TOGAF framework. The TOGAF framework does not mandate that the steps must be performed in the sequence shown, uh, referring to the crop circle diagram. It does not mandate a waterfall method, and it does not specify the duration or the of any phase or the cycle of architecture development. The TOGAF framework does recommend that the ADM be adapted to meet the needs of the enterprise and agility is just one such need. And if I take a very quick look at some of the topics uh, that are covered within the guide, um, the guide so far, because it is work in progress, we're building this up. Uh, we're covering a number of things so far, like how TOGAF can be delivered in that agile iterative style, the way that um, the architecture work can be carved up into various slices. For example, you might take a, a first slice at a very enterprise strategic level, sort of looking at the graphic in the top left on the slide. Let's break that down into some segments and then into capabilities. So making multiple passes around the, the, the ADM cycle. And we give some guidance about how TOGAF can fit in within these overarching agile delivery frameworks. And most of those will describe uh, ways of working, of having teams of teams looking at different aspects, working in parallel on the overall endeavor. Uh, and so there's some guidance about how, um, how phases can be overlapped. So rather than treating that crop circle as something that says do phase A, finish phase A, then start phase B, do phase B, finish phase B, and so on. It's more a question of realizing that, yes, that's the order in which you need to start things and also the order in which they need to finish, but within that there's considerable scope for overlap. And there's also some guidance about how product delivery practices can be applied to the TOGAF standard. That's that sort of very, um, if you like, whole life through life view that uh, product delivery practices teach us. They can be equally well applied to TOGAF. And in fact, it, it already fits quite well if you look at the ADM and uh, where you start off with the uh, visioning phases and then go on through the layers of architecture um, and then think about some of the through life things like governance and change management. That fits very well with product delivery practices, but nevertheless, there's some useful disciplines in, uh, for example, at the front end of that in the discovery phases, I'm thinking about things like design thinking that can be usefully applied in some of the early TOGAF phases. 
So there's a variety of things that we're currently developing guidance on to help applying TOGAF within Agile delivery organizations. The work is continuing. Um, we have group meetings every two weeks. Next one happens to be uh, Thursday next week, May the 7th. And we're using GitLab and ASCII Dark as the way to host and develop the document content. It gives a good environment for the sort of fine-grained, uh, rapid collaborative working that you need to do with this sort of uh, fairly rapid and agile delivery style. Um, anybody who's ever tried to develop, say, a large document in uh, uh, say a product like Microsoft Word uh, with a large team of people, you know, it's very difficult. You have to slice out different sections from people, whereas through GitLab and ASCII doc, it enables everybody to see the entire state of the document and to work on discrete little sections and even see what other edits uh, people are making. So great tool for the job. So we're using um, Agile tools to produce Agile guidance. And it is work in progress to say that again. So uh, if you want to contribute, uh, I would welcome it. If you have, um, particularly if you have current experience of uh, using TOGAF in Agile delivery, particularly large-scale Agile delivery environments, and I would welcome your thoughts and your contributions. See my email on the screen there, chris.frost.uk.fujitsu.com. Um, the only thing I would say is you do need to be a member, a signed up member of the Architecture Forum in order to uh, get into this work and, and therefore get the necessary credentials to um, get into the GitLab repository and the Slack channels and all the other project machinery that's around that. But if you're willing and able and uh, got something to contribute, I would welcome having you on board. And finally, to close, just to come back to a question I opened with, why are we doing this? Another way to look at it. It's undeniable that Agile is king in the marketplace at the moment. It's certainly from the sorts of things that I see uh, in Fujitsu as we get customer requests. Um, most of them will talk about following an Agile delivery style. Um, and it's clear absolutely clear that Agile at scale needs architecture to guide it to a successful delivery. And it's also, the evidence is clear that TOGAF is the number one architecture framework. So all of those things put together, in my view, make a, a winning combination. So the real value I see coming from this guide that we're working on is that it will help us as, uh, as TOGAF skilled architects to a apply those skills and experience and all of the knowledge that we've gained in projects over the world to guide these agile delivery efforts with appropriate architecture towards a successful delivery. Uh, and at the end of the day, that is what we should be doing as professional architects. Okay, that's a, a very quick run through the current TOGAF and agile work. Uh, that's me done. And uh, I will hand back for the panel session. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, Sonia, Nick, and Paul, and uh, Andrew before. So we have hopefully all of you available to uh, pitch in for some of these questions. Um, but I appreciate your insights before we get there um, through those presentations. So. Um, most of the questions are around the Agile topic, um, architecture and Agile, um, the general theme that are these, you know, are these concepts um, fundamentally incompatible? And you know, what I would summarize from, from what I've heard you say is, no, they're not incompatible uh, at all. But um, can you speak to um, yeah, suggestions for um, those who are in organizations being told, oh, enterprise architecture is old hat and they don't need that anymore. It's all about agile. Um, how, how do they help make the, um, the, how do they help explain the value of EA in that scenario? 
I'll, I'll have a go first, if that's all right. Um, yes, please do, Paul. So, I, I, you know, been, been seeing this question now for a few years, um, yeah. and I, I'm going to condition it slightly in that actually most of the times that we do enterprise architecture, um, we are talking of a reasonably sized enterprise um, or ecosystem. So, you know, a, a, a fair scope. Um, and therefore, when you're talking about agile uh, delivery, uh, so how does enterprise architecture sit alongside agile solution delivery, you are still talking in the context of large uh, endeavors. Um, and if we take something and, you know, other frameworks are available, but if you take something like safe or disciplined agile or any of those sort of areas, you'll still see in there that enterprise architecture is identified as critical to the whole effort. It's just up the level. So if you look at safe and I'll pick safe uh, as an example, because um, it's quite widely used amongst a lot of the people I work with, uh, it, it identifies the need for enterprise architecture in sort of setting that, um, uh, identifying what the strategy is and are helping the uh, EPIC and, you know, the EPIC enablers for the portfolios so that people know what it is that they fit within. Um, it, once you drop down into a smaller area, then, uh, you know, it becomes leaner by, by definition. Yeah, so, so that's, that's in there. Um, and yeah. it, you know, they're compatible because what it does, it says it needs to do it. What you'll find in any of those methods uh, or approaches is there's no information about how to. So you can use TOGAF to actually do the how, and it fits the context of an agile solution delivery. The one other thing I'd add to it, and this is quite key, is if you go right down and back to, to agile sort of roots and the whole kind of lean and, and, and scrum sort of approaches, it's about you don't do something if it doesn't add value. I, I think that's the kind of one of the key mantras in Agile, which raises the question, how do you know you are adding value to your enterprise? There needs to be a context. So somebody somewhere has to explain and share that, that context and ensure that people understand it correctly. And that has always been something that we've been able to uh, uh, do as, as enterprise architects. But so it's all in there as part of a, uh, uh, an approach um, and still very compatible. I think it's about fighting the anti-patterns and the myths that Chris referred to um, yeah. more than it is about actually going back and saying that, that what was there um, it isn't applicable. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, something that, that, that uh, as you say, we've been addressing this uh, question for for a number of uh, years now, and and I think, um, you know, that if if we look at the crop circle, Chris said, um, maybe it's because it looks um, uh, like it's to be done in a, in a in a waterfall way, but it's actually, I mean, I'm I'm talking to the experts here, but it it, it was always intended to be an iterative approach, and there's nothing about that uh, the about the architecture development method that means that you can't do that in an agile way. It's uh, it's one of those myths. Um, anyone else got anything to add about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's a, a scale thing, and I think it's your choice of how you actually use um, TOGAF as well. So I think you know TOGAF to me is a, an architecture framework. It can be used for enterprise level um, endeavors as well as solution. Um, endeavors and depending on the, uh, the type of the problem at hand that you try to um, address with with agile you invariably will get into you know architecture conversations at least uh, from a software engineering perspective um, the, the, the um, value um, the thinking that is in um, togaf uh, as those endeavors are scaled up um, there, there, there is value in talking about enterprise architecture and how those patterns can be potentially be brought to bear to uh, kind of accelerate agile work. So I don't think it's an either or situation. I think uh, just uh, or architects need to think about what's most, the delivery teams need to think about what's most appropriate uh, for the challenge that's at hand. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. I would also like to add two very important things that are around mm -hmm. this, which is interoperability and governance. Interoperability, because like Chris also was explaining with the example of the the tower, I mean, you may have different several agile teams delivering at the same time, but if they are not aligned to the single objective, then you are not really adding value. On the other hand, governance is very important because it will allow you to not only measure value, but to be sure that you're still keeping the compliance. The difference is the way that the governance can be applied on Agile effort. It's not that doing enterprise architecture on, on governance in a vacuum, but also that the architect should be embedded into the Agile teams like a consultant. That's why the shift of the role of the architect. So for example, I can see an architect providing guidance to a product owner trying to identify the product backlog and define different priorities, which is a very a good way in which EA can support an agile effort. Interoperability is another one. I mean, you may have different teams working, but uh, it doesn't matter how well you have defined your user stories, there's always going to be some kind of interdependency between them. And that's why where EA can deliver a lot of value. And also there are different dimensions in here. Actually, if you see over one of the white papers that uh, Chris referred to, that uh, paper is addressing a few of those topics. We can talk about, for example, EA supporting the agile enterprise, which is one aspect of that. And in that regard, EA can support decision taking, for example, like uh, making clear your vision and your strategy and have you understand the context and the landscape that you have, uh, providing governance and risk assessment and be sure you're reaching your goals. But also EA can be used and delivered in an agile way, which is a different dimension that it's by the way one of the topics that we are covering in the guide that Chris explained, how we can partition the architect and provide different sprints using the ADM in an agile way. There is also another a guide that is right now in review that it's covering that specific point. So there are different different angles in which you can see this. But overall, I guess like uh, uh, we cannot have a very effective agile practice unless it is supported by enterprise architecture. Right. Thanks, Sonia. And, and on that on that point of the role of the architect, um, the question has come in. Uh, Togaf makes the architect uh, a central and important role, whereas Agile Scrum doesn't have a role for the architect specified. Uh, it's replaced by an engineer, uh, a much more technical platform specialist. How do we bridge that gap? Um, so I think you you talked about doing sprints through the ADM, following those. Uh, Yep, following those uh, Scrum type processes, are other ways to, uh, to to bridge that gap? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I see the architect. We see the architect as one of the key elements in those agile teams. So they can be from the very beginning, defining the epics, defining the strategic objectives, defining defining your product with the product owner, with the business analyst. Uh, defining priorities for your product backlog. And then whenever it comes into more detail with the architectural descriptions of those solutions, you can identify interdependencies. You can be sure that there's no technical depth in what you are delivering using architecture. You can handle your technology, uh, diverse your technology landscape to address that. And then you are supporting also the engineers and the technical people that is in the different teams. If you're using scale, uh, the safe um, framework, or you're using Scrum, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you need to have a technical team that is building the solution. So the architect needs to be there to provide guidance. And also to be sure that there are, when you make your retrospective, your reviews, that the architect is there to be sure that uh, standards are being um, followed that interoperability has been addressed and that you are delivering value at the end. Yeah, I've got a slightly different slant on that in that, you know, the architect will invariably wear multiple hats for the different types of jobs that are at hand. So sometimes they are going to be an engineer. Sometimes they're going to be a business process re-engineer. Sometimes they're going to be a data scientist. Sometimes they're going to be an application expert. Sometimes they're going to be an infrastructure cloud. Um, person. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there may be a little bit of confusion with regards to what architects generally do. They do you know, very often perform these very, very specific delivery roles. And the, the, the better architects are the ones that can easily swap their, their, their hats over as appropriate, the different types of conversations that are at play. Right. Okay. Um, before we leave the topic of Agile, a number of 
questions come in saying uh, any idea when we when this guide might be uh, published a lot of people keen to see it <laughs> and chris is keen to finish it i'm sure um, yeah that, that, that's that's certainly very true steve i mean <laughs> working uh, we're working through uh, some draft content at the moment and you know within the working group um we certainly figure we've got uh, another month or two of work to to go to build the content to a level that uh, we're we're comfortable with. Um, after that, it will have to go through uh, a, a number of review stages. Um, of course, there's plenty yeah. of people on the uh, on the panel who know the the review phases much much better than I do. But uh, there's certainly um, a, a review process that it will need to go through. So it, it's difficult to give a, a an exact an exact time scale, um, and Sonia, perhaps it'd be better if I uh, if I deferred to you because I think uh, as part of what we've discussed around the general evolution of uh, TOGAF, um, this is one of those components that's going into the forward evolution of TOGAF. And I don't know if there's anything else you can add at all about uh, time scales on this. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yes, like Chris is saying, we need to follow a process. Remember that one of the things that make our st standards and publications stronger is the fact that we work based on different points of view and in consensus. So whenever you see a publication of the open group, if it is a white paper, a guide, a more for a standard, you can be sure that this is also following a best practice for different, different industries and regions. So that's why it takes a certain amount of time to, to how good quality they work into the market. So like Chris was saying, this guide is uh, in the draft process right now, so we need to still follow the review process into the forum and into the open group, and then uh, proceed with the publication. On the side of the evolution of the standard, the way that we are doing is, is also to give the TOGAF standard a more agile flavor. Uh, we made a survey a few years ago about what the market was asking for, for the standard. And also, whenever we have done this talk of user groups in a face-to-face -face event and now in a virtual event, we are always gathering some feedback from the market because for us it's very important. And one of the things that the market is telling us is the, the standard should be more usable, easier to be used and consumed. That's why one of the strategies is to decouple the standard in different volumes. Those volumes, some of them will be providing the, the foundation guidance for delivering uh, EA and some others like this in, in this case, Agile and also like digital and new technology trends are going to be guys that are, will be also formal part of the standard, supporting the standard. And we are still working around that specific structure. And so there, all of this is work in progress. Like Chris was saying, we cannot yet explain or say the real specific date because it, it will depend on the review uh, process and, and the definition of the standard itself. But you can be sure that we are constantly working in the architecture forum through the architecture portfolio, like I explained uh, sooner, to deliver all this value as soon as possible because we, we are aware that the market is really needing to have that guidance. So uh, keep in touch with the open group, follow us in the different channels, either if you're a member or a non-member, and you will be on track on that progress. Right. Yes, and that, that was understandably, we've had a couple of questions about uh, when might we see an, an next version of TOGAF, and uh, you know, it, it's work in progress, and uh, uh, when, when, we, uh, when we have it, we can, uh, we can deliver it. So. Thank you. So I'm going to switch from, from uh, Agile. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to address this one to you, Paul, um, since it comes from your, uh, your Winters uh, slide, your Winters drawing. Um, and that is uh, ERP packages tend to come with their own EA method and Agile approach. So what gaps do you see EA filling? The ERP packages come with their own. Um, so as an architect, um, I, I work with the, uh, the the black box, white box approach. And what I mean by that is um, you manage everything outside of a certain scope. Uh, and within that, you, you, you know, you black box it and you can't see what's inside. Okay. Um, and so it depends if, if you have, um, and certainly when I used to work uh, at, uh, at the post office, if we had an external supplier 
providing uh, and delivering an ERP package and within that uh, how it how the architecture was developed at all the, the levels uh, you know the users the processes the information tells you all those sort of definitions everything was contained within uh, that package that ERP package um, uh, that could be uh, black box what I was worried about was the stuff that crossed the boundary and came out because at the end of the day an ERP unless that's the only thing you've got in your organization of interest, um, it won't sit on its own. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I've never seen an ERP be truly wall to wall and have no integration or need to integrate with anything else. So um, where EA definitely comes in on that point is, is how you get information in and out and how you work um, uh, across that. Uh, I, I do a lot of work in nowadays in industrial uh, clients and, and even those that have got large ERP, um, uh, traditional ERP uh, solutions embedded for a long time, more and more they are working with uh, product lifecycle management systems, uh, they're working with uh, operational uh, manufacturing execution systems, and the interoperability needs uh, just keeps re emerging. The ability to be able to control machines and robots and process lines on a shop floor needs uh, data and exchange of data. Most processes have to join up um, across a piece. So, so it's about focusing on the things that are important. To me, I always used to say, uh, as a, from an enterprise architecture point of view, focus on the things that, if you don't focus on them, will get forgotten. If right. there's somebody already looking at the thing inside the ERP and you're paying them to do it, mm -hmm. let them get on and worry about when it crosses the boundary. Right. Right. Thank you, Paul. Um, we'll move on to a different a different topic, um, and it's been the topic of our conference so far this week, uh, digital. Um, uh, are there plans to uh, for TOGAF to address digital and therefore be a useful tool for an organization to go to help it go through a digital transformation? Uh, oh, thank that, Steve. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the response is yes. We are also working, like we are working in this guide about the use of the TOGAF standard into the agile space. We are also working in another, uh, into another working activity into the forum about how the TOGAF standard can be used to support uh, the digital organization in alignment with the DP book. So for that, there's another working group, like the one that Chris is leading into the forum. There are a lot of uh, for Architecture Forum members engaged on that. And also we are working in combination with the Digital Practitioner Working Group, which are the ones that maintain the DP book, because we need to provide alignment on that. That guide is also work in progress. The roadmap is um, uh, alike the one that we are doing about Agile is still uh, in the draft process. And the way that we are facing this is first, how we can use EA principles, along with the DP book principles, to leverage each other. Alignment and leverage in terminology. We have certain terms that are not in in the talk of standard that are related with digital. So we are also addressing that. And the main component of that guide is going to be how EA and the talk of standard can leverage and be used in the four different contexts that we have in the DP book. That for those of you that have been following uh, the event since Monday, we have uh, all the way from the individual, the team, the team of teams, and the enduring enterprise, all those different levels have different needs, and therefore EA should be supplying that and providing some, some guidance and some input on all those different areas. Actually, if you go over the DP book, you will see certain related disciplines for the different contexts being, of course, enterprise architecture, one of them. And then the rest of the guide is going to explain in more detail how the, the architecture process can support the digital enterprise, how the, which components of the architecture content will also support that, and the shift that we need to do into the EA capability itself for it to also become uh, digital, 
because you know there's a certain shift in the role of the architects in the tooling that the architect is using. Uh, all of this is going into other uh, architecture patterns, like for example, microservice architecture, domain-driven design, and all that. So that's another uh, piece of work. Very important also to mention that the work that we are doing around Agile, that Chris explained, is also having alignment with the work around the, the Agile architecture framework that is also a standard in progress. So members of that team, the Agile architecture framework, are active in the talk of Agile activity, and they are also active in the talk of digital activity. So as you can see, we are trying to address this in a way that will be covering the different uh, open group standards and to be sure that we are delivering a consistent message into the market and providing a consistent guidance as well. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Um, lots more questions are coming in and I see uh, um, Paul, you've answered uh, a couple directly in the, uh, the Q&A channel. Um, uh, a suggestion to come in, would it be appropriate to split architecture methodology between architecture domains, e.g. infrastructure technology, and those have to follow a waterfall methodology, and for application and data domains to be governed by agile principles? Does that sound like a winning suggestion? Uh, okay, well, oh, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Um, I'll, I'll come in with a view on that because um, it it relates to something that actually we've been discussing within the uh, Ad Tiger of Agile Working Group. Um, Agile, of course, is, is one delivery style, and it's a very common delivery style, very successful um, in certain environments environments, but it's not necessarily the right choice for, for everything that you do. Right. Um, and the, sort of the example that was given there, um, you know, hints at some situations where perhaps agile might not be the most efficient sort of approach. For example, in, in some infrastructure architecture and design type tasks, uh, don't say all, but possibly in some. <laughs> And so the critical point here is that um, there's a decision to be made about what is the right delivery style to adopt for, for certain pieces of work. And uh, something that we've been debating inside the, uh, the Agile Working Group is potentially putting some content into the guide. It, it, it's not there yet. It's something we're discussing. And we've got some potential draft material about how to look at different possible uh, delivery styles, which of mm -hmm. course includes Agile, and make the decision as to which is appropriate. So I wouldn't necessarily say that you can make it as simple as if it's this sort of yeah. problem, then it's this delivery style, but you can yeah. certainly kind of give some criteria that say if the type of problem you're trying to solve looks a bit like this, or has these mm -hmm. um, criteria, these qualities then this might be the appropriate delivery style because right. yeah, agile is not necessarily the answer to everything no and, a, and a, a quick glance through the chat channel on uh, on this event shows that there are some some people with uh, strong users to uh, weaknesses for agile and it's not uh, it's clearly not a, an answer to everything so um so, um, hey, you can I just, uh, just a quick glory to that one because it's an interesting idea to to sort of split the methodology and look at architecture in two different ways, and, and a lot of it is contextual, of course. So, so there is an argument for doing that uh, in a certain phase. Um, if, if we look at infrastructure, and I'm going to use the cloud word, right? So, if we look at that <laughs> and say, you know, initially when things went sort of cloud-wise, um, you could actually make a good argument for for separating those two out. One of the things certainly now as we move into later sort of uh, uptake, more mature uptakes of, of sort of cloud and modern compute technologies is um, decisions are taken very early on around containerization and microservices and so that. So actually the dependencies between what you might look at, at as your technology layers and your application development layers um, uh, set themselves out quite early. So it's, it is a little bit, uh, dangerous to separate them out totally. Um, just a, a quick analogy I use nowadays, and whether people use cloud or not, um, it's a bit, to, a bit to me like uh, if we look back at the old space race, in that um, 
you know, back in the back in the day when when uh, man went to the moon, um, lots of technologies were developed to get to get man there. Right. You don't need to go to space to have benefited from it. LEDs, lots lots of things were created that helped that. Lots of technologies are available now around things like you know containerization and whatever. You don't have to determine the infrastructure you're going to to take advantage of them in the same way. You don't need to go to space to benefit from those kinds of things because they they give you a completely different way of uh, options around ways of working. So, so actually, you can separate it if you need to to minimise risk, but there's also you lose on some of the benefits. Understood. Always love your analogies, Paul. Thank you. Um, Okay, we are out of time, people. I do want to have respect for people's for people's time. So, um, a, a big thank you to all our all our panelists, uh, Andrew, a little earlier in the day, and uh, Sonia, Paul, Mick, and Chris. Thank you all for your contributions. And if you get the chance to uh, to answer any answered questions that are in the Q and A channel, then please do. Um, and uh, I will I will conclude just by thanking all of uh, all of the participants today, um, hundreds of you have joined us today. It's been uh, it's been great, and um, please, uh, 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 we, you'll you'll uh, get a survey about what you think about uh, about this event and uh, the topics that uh, we might uh, you might be interested in in, in future Togaf user groups. So uh, when you see that, please. Um, take the time to uh, to give us the feedback. We want to deliver the most value we can to you. Um, it's been uh, it's been a great a, gr a great few days. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, about TELEF or Archimage or any of our open group standards, then um, there's there's plenty of information um, provided today and links provided. And I'll I'll make a, a plug for the open group live. Web page, which you can see on the uh, on our website, and on it's linked to the conference site for this event. Um, there, you will find out more about other things that go on in the open group and some context setting. And they say a, a plug for the for the uh, for the library. Lots of materials there, and of course, for taking this opportunity uh, that we now have for you to uh, get certified from the safety and comfort of your own home. So. Um, thank you for joining us today. It really uh, it, it's great to see the the level of interest, and we're always interested in feedback on on what you love about TOGAF and where the areas are that you can uh, that you would like to to see improved. 